right okay so uh, as i can remember uh, what we uh, kept on discussing is the uh, main parameters of uh, sine waves uh, and and basically continuous analog waves uh, so at, in that case we uh, discussed what is frequency uh, what is period and basically what's a sine wave and why the why do we call them uh, sinusoidal or sine waves and uh, when it comes to sine waves the peak amplitude frequency uh, and the period of the uh, wave and phase are the main parameters that we uh, use in communication right when it comes to mathematics when it comes to other aspects uh, there are other parameters like especially when it comes to uh, you know uh, optical physics uh, then when it comes to uh, mechanical or mechanics some sort of things like that uh, we make use of uh, the wavelength um, then uh, some other parameters but especially uh, when it comes to electronics and communication especially communication and telecommunication uh, these are the main parameters uh, that we can make use of interpreting information because our main uh, intention here or our main requirement is to let a physical structure or a physical system um, transfer information from one point to another or interpreting or inserting some information that means uh, which is useful for human to uh, understand and convey their thoughts convey messages so that is why we call them information so if we have a chance of inserting information or interpreting information interfacing information integrating information into a physical system like a signal these are the parameters which uh, will help us in a positive way not not any other right so especially in communication these are the well uh, identified and uh, uh, you know the most uh, popular parameters actually if i make the story very uh, you know brief the popular parameters peak amplitude frequency and phase right if you get a chance of uh, learning if i have time because it's beyond our syllabus as I was telling you, uh, if we have a chance of uh, learning about modulation, I'll try my best to teach at least a little about modulation for y'all, um, if time permits us, or at least by uh, arranging some uh, extra sessions uh, in the later part of this semester. Um, I'll simply explain you what is modulation and what are the techniques, uh, because normally modulation uh, as a lesson will be taught for students who is purely learning uh, communication uh, for you all it's not a, a big need of learning what is modulation in in, in a total scale but i'll try my uh, level best to give some idea about it so when when we are discussing you will understand uh, when it comes to modulation as a technique uh, what we do is now if I tell you some example of modulation types you call it frequency modulation amplitude modulation phase modulation right uh, then when it comes to the digital domain we have uh, frequency shifting key uh, then amplitude shift key phase shift key likewise so all in all these techniques uh, you, you always see these words amplitude frequency and phase modulation means again uh, some sort of uh, or, or or the or the or the technique of interpreting information inserting information into a signal like this that is what we call modulation now simply if you if you take a person and take him into a beauty salon and do some uh, you know uh, make, make make the face up a little bit with all the applying things and all uh, completely we can uh, change the face and change the appearance right change all the features of the face uh, by using all these uh, things that we apply so the person who went in uh, is completely different uh, from its appearance when it comes out that sort of a process is what we call information so we are changing the uh, details we are changing doing a little bit of modifications uh, actually modifications for uh, the specific details of a 
uh, of a face, right? Of a of an existing appearance, uh, and showing a complete different information outside. Uh, just an old lady goes in, but when it when she comes out, it looks like a, a young girl. Uh, based on uh, you might have seen there are videos, a lot of video sharing on this Facebook or, or, or YouTube normally. Uh, especially with, with this, uh, what you call this TikToks and all, you see that uh, there are, uh, you know, some videos regarding this topic. Initially starting with a completely different feature, but right after finishing all this making a process, it, it looks completely different, completely different in another level actually. So same thing happens in a uh, modulation scenario. We take just a row. Uh, signal, just a row system, like uh, just a set of frequencies, maybe a voltage variation. Then we do necessary modifications for selected parameters in different ways to show a completely different message, to give a completely different meaning at the end. This sort of a process is what we call modulation, right? Uh, so what I kept on telling is some examples of modulation techniques, frequency modulation, amplitude modulation, phase modulation. So in frequency modulation, what we do, we use the parameter frequency and we do modifications to show or to, to interpret the information. So you call it frequency modulation. Why? We are changing the frequency parameter according to our need. All other parameters are kept uh, kept constant. Only the frequency changes. When it comes to amplitude modulation, we are keeping the frequency phase the same, but we use the parameter amplitude and do modifications to interpret our information. So you call it amplitude modulation, right? Modulation, modification, uh, changing, all, all are included in this word modulation, right? When it comes to phase modulation, Frequency amplitude kept constant. We are doing modifications to the face of the signal uh, to interpret whatever a message that we have. Okay. Uh, amplitude shift keying. Amplitude shift keying. That means amplitude is going to be shifted according to a logic in digital domain. Th that is the same uh, as amplitude modulation. So we we take a discrete signal or a digital signal. Uh, do modifications to the amplitude or the levels, the constant levels, high and low levels, to interpret information, to change the, the logic, right? Or interpret the digital logic into an analog system. When it comes to radio communication, we need to convert all this digital information into an analog domain uh, so that it is easier for us to create radio signals. Otherwise, it is not going to work. Uh, then frequency shift keying, we get the um, analog signal frequency and we change it according to the digital logic, the frequency change. So that's sort of a thing. So in all these cases, what happens, what I want you to understand is these are the main parameters when it comes to communication um, and when it comes to interpreting information into uh, signals. So we always work with these parameters. So th that is just the recap uh, of what we discussed last session. So we understood what is the what is meant by peak amplitude, then what is frequency, and uh, especially period of a one wave, or period period of a one wave component. Um, it is capital T, and what is the relationship between frequency and capital T? It's inversely proportional all the time. And we uh, went through this picture showing that uh, one is with greater frequency, the other one is with less frequency. So when the frequency is higher, what happens with the period? When the frequency is lower, period is more. When the frequency is high, period is less. Excuse me. And here are some prefix. Um, when period goes into a different range, what happens to the uh, frequency range. Excuse me. And a simple calculation we did.
we did this calculation as well. I hope this, we did this as well before uh, we finish the session. Uh, as what I can remember, slowly, slowly, I'm getting my memory. Right, so I, I hope you have no problems with uh, these simple uh, questions that we discussed. Then uh, I think I uh, discussed. I have I think I have shared a picture um, JPG file uh, with you all before uh, we, 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 we were winding up at that time uh, about this phase when, by referring to a circular motion. I was just explaining how uh, to draw how we plot the sinusoidal wave. Just a simple. Uh, you know. Uh, how can I tell that it's just simple wave component, just a one cycle. Uh, and based on uh, the movement, based on the motion, based on the direction, as well as the angular uh, displacement, right? Based on the direction of movement, as well as the angular displacement, how can we understand the same wave without thinking about its frequency, without worrying about its voltage components, voltage variation, how can we understand a wave based on its angular position? That's what we discussed. So then we understood uh, where it comes, uh, what, what is the exact place where angle is zero, face angle is zero, or angular position is zero, so what is the exact point where the angular position is 90 degrees? <coughs> Then what is the wave position where the ang angle is 180? Then the uh, angular position of the wave when it is 270, 360. Apart from that, uh, what is 45 degrees position, 135 degrees position? Likewise, you can uh, divide the space into half and always uh, get the half value of whatever the angle. Right, so it's it's easy. Then we understood. <laughs> That is exactly same with what you do in mathematics trigonometry. Uh, we know that when um, the angular value, when theta is 60, sine 60 is exactly somewhere else. So you simply put a dot there. Uh, when angle is 65 or angle is 61, you get sine 61. You get a particular uh, amplitude value, so you can plot it there. Uh, just just plot. keep the dot. So that then when the angle goes to 70, you you take the calculator and type sine 70, you get a value, just go and uh, point it there. Then after all, you keep connecting all these points. End of the day, what you get is a sinusoidal shape, right? So all these are uh, the positions that you were marking on that Cartesian plane when it comes to trigonometry uh, is the angle. X axis is the angle, the original angle in theta y axis is the sine value of each angle right we have the degree value just the pure degree value and then we get the sine value of it magnitude you call it the magnitude sine value of it so sine value against the theta value just the um, original angular value that's what we do in trigonometry here in communication or when it comes to uh, electronics when it comes to communication what we draw is voltage in front of time so x axis is time uh, y axis is voltage or amplitude but in the same case based on the logical understanding of what happening in a circular motion in a revolution or in a simple harmonic motion we can understand uh, the wave by referring to its angular positions as well right angular positions as well uh, so angular positions, of course, you cannot take a direct reading. Uh, you cannot take a direct reading because uh, X axis is time, Y axis is voltage. So you don't get a chance of getting a direct reading. But indirectly, indirectly, based on the logical understanding of how this wave is created, we can understand right what is the angular position when it comes to the originating point what is the angular position when it comes to the peak then again at the um, original level on the time axis when it intersects the time axis what is the angular position then it when it goes further down and to the negative peak what is the angular position then again coming back 
to the zero line, coming back to the timeline, what is the angular position? Then it keeps on remaining, uh, keeps uh, continuing all the time. So then you get uh, 360 plus 90, 360 plus 180, 360 plus 270, 360 plus 360, 720. Then you get 720 plus uh, 90, 720 plus 180. Likewise, you, you can uh, make use of going like uh, keep continuing and adding up all these angles to see how many revolutions were happening or how, how many complete cycles. So this is how we understand a wave from its face angle or angular positioning. Right. But when it comes to the component face, when it comes to the specific term face, face uh, to be identified not anywhere else but at the originating point always if you think about face see face describes the position of the wave relative to time zero so always you need to understand this otherwise people are getting confused right people simply say that now for example if i uh, keep my mouse pointer here right hope everyone can see my mouse pointer so i'm going to just keep it here uh, the angular position what i am showing now is 360 angular position of the wave what i am showing now is 360 right so people can say face is 360 no it's wrong don't use the word face to tell this right if you are saying uh, what is the face where I am pointing here, that, that is wrong, right? Wrong way of using the term. This is not face. What I am showing now is the angular position, right? The angular or angle according to the position is 360. If you are specifically using the term face, that is always where the time is equal to zero. That means the originating point, right? originating point so always when time is equal to zero you need to check what is the angular position of the wave now in the first instance you can see in the first case you can see when time is equal to zero angular position of the wave is zero that means there is no any phase shift no any phase shift it is in phase it is already in phase right already in phase Second example, when time is equal to zero, you can see the angular position of the wave. If you think about amplitude, it has already has an amplitude. Amplitude is not zero, already has an amplitude. Right? Frequency, of course, no matter because what we need to do is from wherever time zero, you need to count a one cycle. Right? So here, one cycle completes right at this point right one cycle completes right at this point so you are going to identify a one wave component and just uh, count how many those type of wave components are there within a second right so just just the matter of understanding the shape of a one cycle shape of a wave component so you are going to see the exact shape uh, appearing just just to see uh, how many times the exact shape appears within a second that is what we call finding frequency forget about it it's really easy it's a different story but phase is a bit confusing for for students because uh, they they normally do that mistake they used to uh, always use the word phase to identify angular positions so they, you have to use two two terms separately when you are talking about different angular positions, you have to use angular position of the or wave position angle, wave position angle, angular position of the wave or wave position angle. But when it comes to time zero, it is quite specific. You call it phase when time is equal to zero. If you if you can see that there is a phase angle, uh, sorry, there is an angular position other than zero, that is a phase shift. In the third example, you can see when time is equal to zero, angular position or where the wave starts is uh, from 180 degrees. Uh, that is the angular position of the wave. So you can say that th this has a 180 phase shift. 
right 180 degrees phase shift right okay so this is what we call uh, what 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 is the meaning of the term phase so please uh, understand when it comes to defining phase you have to always specifically say that when time is equal to zero right reading of the angular position of a wave when time is equal to zero or phase describes the position of the wave form relative to time zero either way okay it's up to you how you define it but make sure that you are using time is equal to zero that's a must when you are defining phase right okay and you I hope you know uh, the the relationship between uh, radians and uh, degrees right uh, radians we we uh, use the parameter uh, pi so 2 pi is uh, equal to 360 radians right 360 uh, sorry 360 degrees uh, 2 pi radians is equal to 360 degrees therefore uh, 180 degrees is just 1 pi um, 90 degrees is pi divided by 2 uh, or 2 pi divided by 4 right so in that way also we can uh, talk about phase so when it comes to phase uh, you see both uh, in degrees as well as radians so you need to uh, get used to both parameters uh, sorry both units actually because in in some content that you uh, will be interacting with when you are going for different uh, aspects uh, you might see phase angle discussed in degrees but uh, in some other cases you will see phase angle uh, discussed in uh, the unit radians so you need to uh, make sure that you are you are you, you are all right with both the uh, both the units normally that is covered in mathematics when you, when you are learning uh, trigonometry uh, we were using both uh, units to discuss so by now i hope that it's not a big deal uh, dealing with radians and degrees with you all right so uh, if you if you are still having doubts keep this in your mind uh, 360 degrees is equal to 2 pi radians pi is 3.14 or simply you can use a calculator it's already given in default setting it, it has given straight away you can just type uh, or, or just hit a one uh, button and get the pi value right <coughs> exactly that is what we, we, we use um, so here we have a uh, example i think we didn't discuss this a sine wave is offset uh, one over six cycle that means a sine wave has offset one sixth of a cycle with respect to time zero what is the phase in degrees and radians what is the phase in degrees and radians right just go through the question and see whether you get the point the sine wave is offset one sixth of a cycle uh, with respect to time zero now, now with respect to time zero in the sense this is completely talking about a phase angle and offset one sixth of a cycle has offset it offsetting means what is the meaning of offset the word offset we are going to uh, assume that you are going to keep something on a table just uh, laying it on a table then the next instance you are going to lift the object from the table moving your hand a little bit uh, into either left or uh, right side and placing the object the, the, the whole object somewhere else on the table right so that sort of operation is what we call offsetting right offsetting simply lifting it from a one position moving it a little bit further and placing it back the whole structure is going to place as it is. You call it offsetting, right? Without decomposing or without, uh, how can I say that? Without uh, destroying the uh, parameters, without destroying its dimensions, without destroying the shape of the, of the object. If you are lifting the whole thing without uh, introducing any internal changes, the whole lot will be lifted and shifted. That is what you call offsetting. 
I don't know whether you have seen in some countries, um, they are going to construct a house in a one place, in a yard, and they, are, they used to uh, shift the entire house from that yard to a, some other uh, geographical area or, or some other land. So house will be configured or all these walling and all, they were using different, you know, not like here, we are not bricks and cement, but in another technique. Right, like uh, how can I say that? Uh, maybe, maybe wood or maybe uh, concrete, uh, you know, slabs to fix the thing. Whatever the technique doesn't matter, but they are going to fix the house, right? Fix the house in a one specific point, uh, and use trailers, use all these um, pullers and all to shift the entire house from one position to another. So what they do in the lands is only uh, laying down the foundation. And they are going to shift this house from one point to that specific place and, you know, place it on top of the foundation and do necessary fixing, whatever it is. Right. So that that is what you call offsetting, setting the house, setting all the cases in another yard, taking the complete structure without doing any modifications, any changes, taking the complete structure into another place is what you call offsetting. So. Now you can see here we had an original sine wave. The first uh, picture shows you the original sine wave without any phase shift. So no offsetting, just the original picture. This is the original picture. This is something like you are going to keep on the table in the first instant. Then you lift it. You lift the object, move the object little bit to left side, little bit to your left side and then again placing it on the table. Now here, the same wave were being lifted. Same wave were being lifted and shifted a little bit to left side. Right? And place it back. Place it back. Right? It has been placed. It. This is what we call offset. It. Now, this is one fourth of the cycle. Just 90 degrees. A one quarter is offset. Here, no. No offsetting. Just the original shape. But the second case, you can see that one fourth of a cycle, quarter of the cycle, quarter of a one wave component has shifted to the negative domain. That means offset, right? One fourth is offset. In the third example, exactly half of a cycle is offset, is shifted. Lifting the wave, shifting to the left side until you reach the point 180. So it represents a half a cycle, 180 degrees represents a half a cycle. So complete half of the time duration is offset. Now, this give you some support, understanding the scenario explained in this question. A sine wave is offset one sixth of a cycle with respect to time zero. Now think, what is the angle? So what is the phase in degrees and radians? Just give a try, just give a try to see whether you can figure it out. First of all, you need to understand it says one sixth of a cycle. One cycle is 360 degrees or two pi radians. Right? One cycle is 360 degrees. So one sixth of a one cycle means one sixth of 360 degrees or one sixth of uh, two pi radians. Very easy. OK, so just uh, give a try figuring out the both answers. Then uh, I will I will show uh, the answer. The most important thing is whether uh, to see whether you understand the question and whether you can uh, cope up with it by getting an answer. That is the important thing.
one sixth of 360, one sixth of two pi radians. So when it comes to solution, it says we know that one complete cycle is 360 degrees. Therefore, one sixth of a cycle is you can uh, calculate it in both ways phase in degrees phase in radians so when it comes to phase in degrees you can see simply one sixth times 360 or 360 divided by six answer is 60 degrees right so phase shift is 60 degrees phase shift is 60 degrees right 60 degrees phase shift. Uh, when it comes to radians, again 2 pi divided by 6. 2 pi is 3 times, uh, sorry, 2 times 3.14. And when it comes to calculator, you can simply uh, press the button. So it gives you uh, 3.1337, something like that, or 3.14. So many, uh, some, some other uh, decimal values. But anyway, multiply it from 2 and divide from 6. Okay. So you get 1.04666 radians, right? Uh, 1.05 uh, if you round it up to the nearest. Uh, so 0. Uh, 1.05 radians phase shift when it comes to radians. So 60 degrees in radians, 1.05 approximately, right? Uh, so this is the phase shift. Now think about drawing or plotting this uh, scenario on a on a graph or as a graph how how would it look like just give a try i i think i i don't have the picture given here but i just want to see whether you can draw it right so here you have uh, 90 degrees phase shift 180 degrees phase shift so see whether you can draw 60 degrees phase shift 60 degrees so how to find 60 degrees? You take the half a cycle, which is uh, 180 degrees. Just try to divide this, uh, what do you call, the time span of a half a cycle in, into three equal intervals. That means you are dividing a half a cycle equally into three. One portion represents 60 degrees. <coughs> Excuse me. One portion represents 60 degrees, right? You take half a cycle, this time span, and divide it into equal, equally dividing it into three times time slots. Each time slot represents 60 degrees angular area. So from zero to the first time gap, if you vertically draw a line upwards where it goes and intersects, the signal is where you get 60 degrees angular position. So what you need to do is offset until you get that position, come and intersect the y axis. That is 60 degrees phase shifted signal. OK. 60 degrees phase shifted signal. So normally uh, your, your signal uh, needs to uh, move like this much. So where you need to start is somewhere around here. Right. The wave will start not at 90, not at 90, but somewhere around here where I am pointing right now. 60 degrees will be somewhere like this. OK, so not complete 90 degrees phase shift, but 60 degrees phase shift. OK, right. So give a try. Uh, and if you if you have a chance, just share the picture on the chat time so I can verify uh, during the session if you if you can do it. So everybody uh, will get a chance of seeing it. Right, so I hope you are all right with uh, finding the face angle by now. Then uh, the other para other parameter, apart from frequency, phase and amplitude, the other parameter is wavelength, right? Especially when it comes to uh, optical fiber, since we are dealing with light waves uh, or the main mode of transferring information is light, which is electromagnetic radiation and in, in the visible uh, light spectrum. When it comes to frequency, frequency is extremely high. Uh, therefore, when it comes to optical physics, optical science, 
oh, optical scenario normally uh, we used uh, we normally the method that we used to differentiate waves differentiate things uh, using frequency uh, is not uh, much reliable or much accurate uh, is because of the high radiation since frequency is very very high uh, understanding the amount of uh, complete cycles is really difficult understanding how many complete cycles within a second is really difficult when it comes even when it comes to electronic components electronic systems oscillators um, letting the oscillating circuits rlc circuits to vibrate uh, in a in a such a high frequency and uh, trying to figuring things out is hard because of high radiation it is like very speed now if you think that there is a um, just a one stick uh, wobbles or one stick keep vibrating right back and forth high frequency means the vibration speed is very high so it's very it's really hard to count let's say like that generally it's it's really hard to count the number of cycles so in that case instead of using the term frequency instead of using using the parameter frequency to differentiate waves we take wavelength because you you understood that uh, when the frequency is high wavelength is tiny wavelength goes down when the frequency is low wavelength is greater or period of a one wave is greater so normally wavelength uh, is the exact length in meters of a one cycle right so when it comes to high frequency uh, applications visible light infrared uh, x-rays gamma rays in medical industry, we deal with X-rays. Uh, even different X-rays, different frequencies are identified or, or, or used not from its frequency value, but from its wavelength value, right? Uh, because it's from meters, nanometers, micrometers, likewise. That, that much ranges, right? Uh, normally nanometers. They deal with uh, all these light rays and all. When it comes to uh, laser beams, uh, if there is any application in the industry uh, deals with laser, different, uh, you know, range lasers like green color laser, blue laser lights, uh, red color laser lights. Likewise, there are different colors. Uh, color differencing means frequency is different. So, but we are not going to exactly use the parameter frequency actively by keeping the frequency staying by itself, we always used to deal with the wavelength in the case of differentiating different colors and frequencies. That is why I told you normally wavelength is used uh, in optical uh, physics, in optical application uh, and further X-ray, gamma rays or some other medical applications. Uh, why we are using it is because frequency is very high since it's highly radiation. Uh, so it's really hard to count when it comes to electronic circuits, when it comes to uh, digital uh, electronics, digital circuits. Uh, counting uh, is not uh, that easy. Clocking is not that easy. So therefore, we go with a quite physical uh, parameter length or wavelength. It is easier for uh, easier for us to deal with. Apart from that application, when it comes to radio communication, wireless communication, you all already know by now, uh, wherever you see a wireless communication, uh, there should be an antenna. Antenna is a must. Even in your mobile phones, you have several antenna systems. One for one system is for the Wi-Fi. Uh, the other is for the GSM. Uh, then if you are having a radio uh, application, it's already there normally inbuilt. Um, if you are using your mobile phone to listen to radio channels like listen to music through radio that means you have a radio system so that there is an antenna so normally for all these systems we have a separate antenna uh, application in our mobile phone when it comes to your computers your laptops if you are dealing with a laptop which is uh, connected with wi-fi it has a uh, antenna uh, to grab signals and in ordinary uh, television sets we have antennas fixed on top of uh, our roofs. Uh, if there is a radio, we have an antenna. If you think about audio systems in a vehicle, we have a simple aerial. You can see that on top of the somewhere else on top of the roof, we simply pull it up. If you are willing to listen to music, 
so there are aerials. In walkie talkies, you see aerials, uh, simple aerials. When it comes to bigger marine communication, um, uh, other type of uh, communication, uh, military communication with all these military, uh, you know, uh, camps and all, all these sites, you can see bigger antenna towers. When it comes to airports, you see bigger antenna towers. So wherever you see unguided communication, that means wireless communication antenna is the most important critical element uh, that deals with this communication. <clears throat> so when we are designing the antenna, uh, when it comes to antennas, again, the same problem comes students. Uh, if this is a communication uh, engineering discipline, uh, you will be specifically having wireless communication as a module radio communication engineering or radio engineering as a module in that there's a specific chapter for antennas right in that we talk about uh, the, the the components of an antenna now normally if you think about a television antenna everyone everyone knows that uh, you, everyone uh, might have been seen television antennas with uh, several elements uh, all those elements will not radiate the radio signal, right? That is true. We have many uh, elements, many, you know, uh, strips that you might have seen, right? Many strips. All these strips are not equally uh, vibrating or e equally uh, transmitting the signal. There is only a one element. You call it the dipole, right? There is only one active element electronically connected with the transmitter, uh, which keeps on this transmitting or the receiving process electronically active. All other elements are passive elements. All, all of you have are very much concerned about this dish antennas, especially with, uh, you know, uh, satellite TV, dialogue TV or whatever other TVs that people uh, used to have. Uh, they, they are fixing a dish antenna on top of the roof somewhere aiming some particular direction, right? You, you must have seen, you call it parabolic antennas, dish antennas. So that dish is not uh, active. This is just to uh, reflect, right? Radio beams reflect the rays into a one focal point, right? As we were learning in these lenses um, in science those days, uh, there is a thing called focal point. When you send several light rays, the, the lens used to focus it, collect all these light rays into a one point, you call it focal point. You use magnifying glasses when we were in grade six, grade five, uh, magnifying glasses to uh, burn things. We simply burn, uh, you know, papers and all. How, how come it happens? Uh, when you hold it to the sun, all the solar radiation comes through the magnifying glass, will be collected to a one specific point. So when it comes to heat, when it comes to infrared rays, everything is, is in uh, electromagnetics, but through with this magnifying glass, it helps all these rays, all these heat rays come and join in a one particular point. So at that point, temperature increasing in a exponential manner, right? Temperature goes up in an exponential manner and that is enough to start burning things, especially all uh, dry leaves, papers, right, cotton, things like that. We used to burn those days. Right. So what is happening? Uh, it is uh, focusing into a one point. Same thing happens uh, in a dish antenna. The signals come from the satellite, from the sky will be reflected because of its parabolic shape. It, it is reflecting it back to a one focal point. At that focal point, you have this active element placed, right? Active element placed. Uh, let me check uh, uh, whether we can get a chance of. Uh,
really sorry. Uh, I told you there's a problem with my computer. It's really slow to check what's wrong with it later on. Right. Okay. All right, so now you can see many uh, example. Hope everyone can see. Can someone please uh, reply? Let's see whether you get the uh, pictures. Yes, sir. We screen. Right, good. Okay, so now if I if I talk about uh, the second picture here, and, and in all, all, all the pictures, what you can see is the dish, is the parabolic dish, and there is an element placed a little bit uh, further from the dish. In all the cases, you see that, right? I just want to wanted you all to uh, identify that. So here, even this sort of thing you see when it comes to satellite TV application, wherever a house has a satellite TV connection, you see this sort of antenna. So here the dish and a little bit further away from it, you have a small arm like thing uh, to hold something. What you have here is what we call the active element of an antenna. Active element of an antenna, you simply call the dipole of the antenna, dipole. So what happens uh, in this antenna is some sort of a thing like this. When it comes to transmission, we use this dipole place on the focal point and we we transmit the signal not to the direction what we want, but we transmit the signal. We use the dipole to transfer the signal towards the dish, towards the dish, to, towards the parabola. Then what happens, same as we were learning in optics in science, when you transfer uh, the, the transmits the signal, propagates the signal towards the dish. The dish is to reflect it back in a beam type of a thing. So what we get to whatever the desired direction is not just simply, you know, propagated signals all around the area, but quite, uh, you know, streamlined. All these rays going out from a focal point will be nicely streamlined and there will be a uh, healthy radio beam formed. So this beam will uh, go because the strength of the beam is a bit higher compared to sending a signal just in omnidirectional because when it comes to dipole, it keeps on uh, propagating signal in many directions. So what happens is the strength of the radio signal will decay. It will attenuate, right? The strength goes down. So for, to, to overcome that problem, we use this dish, we use this parabolic uh, shape uh, to, to get all these rays aiming in different directions, streamlined and, you know, aim to one specific direction. So we form a radio beam here. So strength of the beam is higher. So it, it will go some more uh, when it comes to direction, it, it transfers into more direction without attenuating, without losing its energy, right? So you call it uh, directional uh, antennas, quite directional antennas, right? It is always aiming a one specific direction. Um, so here in all these cases, you see that either it's a receiving, it can be a receiving antenna or a transmission antenna. Doesn't matter, we still have the parabolic dish and the dipole uh, or the active element placed on the focal point, right? focal point. Uh, when it comes to antenna terminology, you call it feed point, the feeder, antenna feeder. Okay. So the cable is connected not to the dish, cable is connected to this feeding point, antenna feeder. Right. Okay. So you, if you see, uh, talk, think about the cables, you get this cable and cable is not connected with the dish, cable is connected with this focal point. Right. Or the active element. Right, so that is the electronically active element. Uh, this is a passive element when it comes to an antenna. Okay. Right. Uh, so, in all these cases, when when we are designing antennas, not the dish, but this um, active element, this this dipole or the feeding feeder system, uh, the main parameter we are referring to is uh, what you call uh, the wavelength. Right, is the wavelength. 
uh, if I show you uh, the other example, Yagi and na. Sorry. This shape is uh, very popular. No, everybody uh, even have a when we from the small days when we say antenna antenna when we when we hear the word antenna this is the picture that we are getting all the time here especially this one this is the picture we get okay because uh, those days even now you see this sort of an antenna uh, always uh, is is hanging you know on top of the roofs of houses you call it uh, Yagi antennas, the, per, the person who invented. There are two people, Japanese people, who have uh, came up with this type um, long time back. One is Yuda, one, one uh, person's name is Yuda, the other per person is Yagi, two Japanese fellows. To credit those people who have invented this uh, concept, uh, we call it Yuda Yagi antennas, right? But to make, the, make it a bit shorter, you simply call it Yagi antennas when it comes to communication aspects. Uh, so here, since you can see that there are a lot of elements, element one, two, three, and there's a, some, some sort of a special shape, and then again, another long element. Um, out of all, the element here, what I'm showing now is the active element. The coaxial cable come and join with this. All others are not electronically active. All other, other elements are for some other reason, just to, streaming line or just to aiming uh, or making the signal be directional right so the, that is too much detail to talk right now because it's out of our scope that's why i told you if you are a, if you all are communication students uh, you can learn all these things what is happening but this is uh, too much for us but uh, getting to know about the active element is important because you all are electronic students uh, you call this dipole why that we call it dipole? Di uh, represents number. It pre represents the number two. That means di means two. You know that. Uh, di means two. Two poles. We have two poles. Basically, uh, normally you know that uh, when it comes to a coaxial cable or a uh, communication or electronic application to transfer a signal, we have a life and a uh, neutron. So when it comes to a uh, or you call it positive and ground, right? Positive and ground or live and neutral. When it comes to coaxial cables, when it comes to communication, cable communication, we have a uh, co cable, co and ground. Coaxial cable, we have a co and a mesh, right? Plus and minus, you have both. So in antennas also, what we do is we take this, uh, how can I show one second? Uh, if I take a dipole, um, let me check whether we have any, right? Uh, right, if we get this picture, right, if this is a bit, bit clear, right? So here, uh, this is the active element, what I am pointing now, Right, pointing out now is the active element. So they call it driven element, right? Driven, driven element. These are directors. The the back one is reflector. That is how we name them, the elements. So here we have the driven element or the active element. Why that we call it dipole? That is important to know, right? Doesn't matter that you all are electronic students, but this is an important information. Dipole can why do, why do we call it dipole? Is because we have two poles. One pole to this side, the other pole comes to the other side. When it comes to cable, uh, since in the coaxial cable we have the core and the mesh or the grounding part, the grounding part connects with the one pole, the core or the positive part connects with another pole, right? Connects with another pole. So in the feeder, you call it, a, normally we call it sunbox. When it comes to normal uh, application, you call it the sunbox or the feeding point. So in the feeding point, you get the two, uh, you know, ends of the cable. The positive end goes to a one pole. The negative end goes to the other pole. So basically, from outside, you can just see a one element, one stick. But uh, logically, we have two sticks, 
two poles. They call it dipole, right? Dipole. Then what is this? What's this? This is also a dipole, but you call it folded dipole. Folded dipole. We normally use this mechanism to increase the intensity of uh, the transmitting or the receiving signal. Just having a having a dipole, but if you can multiply it from another one, we can uh, output a lot of intense, intensive or a lot of rays. If it is receiving, just receiving by a one dipole, uh, you can double it if you have two dipoles. So increasing uh, either the propagation rate or the transmission rate, we go for this sort of a um, arrangement. You call it folded dipole. You can see the two ends are folded, folded dipole. But still the same, this is dipole. One, one side goes with the uh, mesh of the coaxial. The other side goes with the core of the coaxial. Okay, folded dipole. <clears throat> but now you know, by now you know, uh, even though you have a lot of elements in an antenna, all these are not electronically active. All these are for other different, uh, you know, uh, reason. But there is only a one element which is electrically uh, or electronically active. So in this application, you can see that there is no any cables running to other elements, but uh, the cable comes only uh, to this, this specific element here. So this is a dipole. Right. OK, so when it comes to dipoles, we have single dipole and folded dipoles. And when it comes to different different applications for this Yagi antenna, there are a lot more modifications. This is uh, some sort of a modified Yagi antenna, right? When, so that is just for um, different applications of so making things much more directive, making the intensity high, uh, then the direct, uh, distance of the radio transmission, if you need to increase or decrease accordingly, we do modifications for the other elements, but dipole is dipole, right? There is no any uh, problem with it. So when it comes to designing antennas, the main parameter we rely on is the frequency of the signal that we are transmitting. Now, for example, assume if we need to transmit uh, 100 hertz radio signal or uh, 1100 kilohertz or 100 megahertz radio signal is our requirement. So based on this 100 megahertz key, frequency we need to design the dipole we need to get the dimensions of the dipole so how to get it we simply use uh, the uh, let me uh, come up with uh, one second uh, here right we simply uh, come up with this uh, equation hope you can see um, Not this one, actually. Lambda is equal to velocity times uh, time. No, I'm not talking about that. Um, I hope you can remember there is an equation called V is equal to F times lambda. Or C is equal to F lambda. That, that, that uh, of course, we were uh, using in our all-level science. Right? V is equal to F lambda. V is the velocity of whatever the wave. Uh, lambda is the wavelength, f is the frequency, <coughs> f times lambda, right? So based on this, when it comes to radio communication, especially in radio communication, we know that all these radio signals are electromagnetic. So all the electromagnetic waves are having uh, 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 some sort of a universal frequency, the constant, fre uh, constant velocity. You call it speed of light. To make the long story short, you call it speed of light. What is speed of light? Everyone knows 3 into 10 to the power 8 meters per second. So this is a constant. Wherever we deal with the electromagnetic signal, doesn't matter the type changes, but it has a constant frequency, constant velocity, right? It's a constant. So that is why uh, we, we use the term C. It's a special case. So when it comes to radio signals, we use the term C and based on that, the uh, equation will be C is equal to F times lambda. 
C means the velocity of the electromagnetic radiation or speed of light equals F is frequency, lambda is uh, what you call uh, wavelength. So when we know the velocity of the electromagnetic radiation, speed of light, we already know it's a constant value. When we know the frequency, the only thing we don't know is lambda. We can do a simple you know, simplification and find the lambda from that equation. Lambda is the wavelength of that frequency. Right? Lambda is the wavelength of that frequency. So we use that value. We use that wavelength value in, in, in different different frequencies to design uh, or take the dimensions of these dipoles. Right? So in all these different antenna applications, all these different shapes that you see here is specified for different needs right for mobile communication for radio communication for television communication this and that right? all are for different use especially this is mobile communication right this is a mobile communication antenna uh, you see these sort of things in icbt somewhere on on you know ceilings uh, fixed that is for wi-fi applications right so these sort of things so inside if you remove this casing inside what you can see is dipoles and some other mechanism for directing waves in, in specific directions. OK, so based on different different applications or requirements, antenna shape can be different, but the principle is not going to change. Principle is we having a dipole, which is the active element. The length of the dipole is based on the lambda value that we are finding uh, from its uh, key frequency. What is the uh, equation v is equal to f times lambda right v is equal to f times lambda when it comes to radio communication v is always a constant which is speed of light so we call it c is equal to f times lambda so when you know the frequency accordingly you can find its lambda value right so based on the lambda value we take different fractions of the lambda value uh, to create the dipole right lambda by two half of the lambda uh, one fourth of the lambda lambda by four right three lambda by five likewise there are different proportions different uh, fractions based on different applications that is how these antennas are uh, designed and and simple uh, now by now i hope you understood what is basically happening what sort of a thing at least happening in these antennas and specially don't forget that antennas are having the main element you call it active element or the driven element you call it dipole why do we call it dipole is because we have logically two poles created one negative one positive uh, then that is how the cable is connected now here you can see uh, inside a sun box these two poles are not having uh, a physical connection these two poles doesn't have a physical connection this cable one side goes to this element, the other side goes to the other element. These two elements are not connected, uh, you know, physically connected. But through a circuit, through a logical system, it is having a connection. When it one goes negative, the other goes positive. When the other goes positive, the other goes negative. This is alternative, right? This, this uh, logic changes alternative according to the alternating frequency that we are sending. So this is what creates uh, the, the radio signals jumping out, right? Uh, there are some more to discuss, but it, we are totally going out of uh, our, our, our discussion. Mm, just to tell you how uh, actually the radio waves going out, but it's a, it's a lengthy discussion. I have to do a demonstration and show uh, when the vibration, when the frequency of a vibration goes on and on, goes up on and on, what happens to uh, the intensity, what happens to the force, what happens to the energy, that, that starts overflowing. Now you simply fill some water into a glass, keep it on a table and try to move the glass back and forth faster, right? The water inside starts bearing this, this motion without spilling water. But when you increase the speed of moving back and forth, the water starts jumping out, water starts spilling, spilling out, water spills. Why is that? 
based on the motion, based on the vibration, as a one specific element, there is a amount of energy that it can bear. But when the energy supply, when the radiation gives more and more oscillations, energy will not be able to, or the element will not be able to bear that energy. So it keeps overflowing the energy out. That is what we call electromagnetic radiation coming out from these antennas and we call it radio waves or Wi-Fi signals, GSM signals, that sort of a thing. Just to uh, give you a you know, brief understanding how this works. But anyway, now you know, by, uh, by now you know what is an antenna. In antenna, all the elements are not active. There is only a one element active, you call it dipole. And now you know why that we call it a dipole. And the length of the dipole is directly based on the lambda value of frequencies. That means wavelength, right? So that is why students, uh, we have to learn or we have to consider uh, wavelength as an important parameter when it comes to communication, okay? Uh, in optical fiber, uh, in, in optical science, in optical physics, that is a different story is beyond the communication aspects, but the, the, the optical physics helps us deal with optical fiber communication, right? Then wavelength, when it comes to uh, antenna, um, when it comes to antenna uh, designing, wavelength is the main important parameter to decide the length of the dipole. Whatever the frequency that we, we want to transmit, we take the exact three frequency, by using V is equal to F lambda formula, we find the necessary lambda value of that frequency. Then we go for different different fractions of that lambda, um, lambda value uh, to figure out the length of the required dipole, right? Uh, so now I hope you understand uh, why that we uh, need wavelength as a parameter in communication. Right? The wavelength is the distance occupied by one cycle. Right. So here, uh, if I uh, make use of a, a diagram now here from the originating point up to 360 degrees. Here, 360 degrees completion is a one cycle, whatever, the, what is the length? <coughs> Excuse me. What is the physical length in meters? Not in time, not any logical uh, understanding, just uh, physical meaning. You just get a uh, foot ruler and you can, you must be able to measure it or a meter ruler must be able to measure, or a tape must be able to measure. It's just a physical length in meters, what we call uh, the wavelength or the lambda value, okay? So from peak to peak, right? From negative peak to negative peak, all these are completing one cycle. So from one specific point to the same repetitive specific point, the length is one wavelength or one lambda, okay? hope it's uh, it's all right with you then um, the other important thing today two domains when it comes to plotting waves in communication when it comes to uh, plotting the graphs of waves or identifying or trying to understand signals there are two types of graphs that we are referring to. One is named time domain graphs. The other one is frequency domain graphs. Okay, frequency domain graphs. In mathematics, I don't know whether you have gone through this yet. We have range and domain or value and range. Okay, value and range in, in, in um, spe specifically when it comes to equations, right? We normally uh, consider a one part of the equation is the value, the other part is the range, right? Or value or domain, things like that. Values and domains. When it comes to uh, these sort of graphs, that day I told you when I'm uh, explaining digital and analog, the difference between a digital and an analog or discrete and analog i i was explaining you all uh, to understand these uh, two axes in a different way normally we know that this is y axis x axis that is the inbuilt thing it's in our blood wherever you see this sort of an application you call this y axis x axis everybody knows it 
then we call it x axis is time then only you will understand it y axis is amplitude when we say that even without a picture you can draw the picture in your mind because you know x and y very well right and uh, the other way of interpreting this or giving a meaning you you can take this x axis or the horizontal axis that is the range instead of calling it x axis or specifically time or anything you can call it the range right uh, y axis whatever comes with y axis you call it value value okay value so value and range the other way around instead of using the term range to represent the horizontal axis or the x axis you can use the term domain domain right so values and domain how come the values keep on changing within a particular domain okay within a particular domain so if we think about a range now from here to here you see a range where do you see this range you see this range in a domain what is the domain domain is time domain is time <clears throat> right if i change the domain sorry if i change the domain not time but it is frequency the parameter interpretation for the horizontal axis has changed now the now the parameter right now the parameter comes with the horizontal axis is frequency now you see a range right you see a range in a domain what is the domain this time domain is frequency right so simply this is what we call time domain graphs frequency domain graphs so, so you have to specify be, be quite specific when it comes to communication right when it comes to electronic cases whatever it is wherever you are going to represent a signal from its graphic format from its graph right we are going to plot it on a on a cartesian plane like this you must be very careful and very keen on nicely understanding what is the domain that you are working or you are displaying your results most the time right in electronics there is no big deal whatever you do is time 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 all the time what you get is time domain but communication you have a frequency domain as well wherever we are not able to plot the graph like this this is easy because the frequency is very less but when it comes to radio signals in megahertz upper kilohertz gigahertz range we cannot use a pen or a software to draw it even though it is drawing it we are not able to identify a one cycle because wavelength or the period is that much tiny micro micrometers or sometimes um, um, what do you call milli milliseconds microseconds nanoseconds so how can we identify that sort of a simple time duration our human systems uh, frequency is 16 hertz right 16 hertz of a variation could be easily understood not more than that 16 hertz is the maximum uh, variation max maximum vibration that we can identify from our human system especially eye and the brain more than 16 hertz we are not capable of understanding the vibration right that is why when you see a fan rotates especially a ceiling fan rotates or some other thing rotates you will not understand uh, how many cycles that it goes you you, you will not be able to understand the uh, rotation of one revolution it goes very fast uh, we don't know but if you use a blinking light somehow you might have do, done this uh, simple you know funny experiments during your small days when we have a torch we try to blink it on and off uh aiming a fan or a ceiling fan and see sometimes you can see the uh, blades right that means you are creating a different frequency and doing some modulation through that modulation from your bare eye as well as the brain you will be able to understand the motion in some sort of a you know a muted uh, or, or, or some sort of a post manner right so that's a, we forget about it anyway uh, human system is not capable of identifying lot of variation so when it comes to oscilloscopes when you are trying to uh, observe a high frequency alternating current you will not be able to easily understand uh, a one complete cycle so at that point 
we simply without worrying with uh, this time domain graphs we identify all the frequencies and we go and plot it on a frequency domain graph so one simple sine wave or one simple analog signal like this doesn't matter what is the frequency can be easily represented in a frequency domain graph by a one straight line if the frequency is not going to change now in this example the frequency of this analog wave is 6 hertz when it comes to the frequency domain it's just a one line right on top of the position 6 hertz <clears throat> the height of the line is the peak amplitude 5 volts peak amplitude is 5 volts so you see 5 volts so in frequency domain graphs always the time uh, the y axis is value right voltage current amplitude whatever it is it's value it is not going to change y axis is always amplitude but x axis or the horizontal axis keeps changing sometimes it's time you call it time domain when it's frequency you call it frequency domain so what is the advantage here whatever the harder frequencies to identify we can simply go to the frequency domain graph and identify all the ranges um, spectrum you call it spectrum analysis as you observe signals in oscilloscope we use spectrum analysis to observe signal. Right. In communication, we have this uh, analytical device in use. Let's take the uh, pictures. There you go. Just uh, from uh, from its outside, it looks like an oscilloscope, but you call it a spectrum analyzer. OK. Spectrum analyzer or a frequency analyzer. So here what you see is not a time domain outcome through the screen. What you see is a frequency domain outcome. Now, if you think about this picture. Sorry, uh, it's not much clear. It's a bit, bit, bit blur. Uh, let me see whether we have a. Uh, some, some clear picture, but. Right, anyway. Hope you, you all can somehow see what is going on. So in this, what you have is a frequency domain graph. The y axis is giving us the, um, what do you call the amplitude in, in volts, in volts, but x axis is frequency. What you can see here is, a, is three spikes, three spikes in a specific frequency uh, point. See, here this is a one reading. Uh, all right, you get a clear picture now. See here you get a one reading and here you get another reading and another reading. So these are frequencies positioning. You get three spikes. What you see here is other frequencies, noise frequencies. Now we were talking about noise. Now this is how you see noise on a frequency spectrum analyzer. Right? I told you normally the signal components, the wanted components needs to be kept in a higher amplitude values uh, to overcome the effect of noise effect of noise not noise noise cannot be totally or completely uh, removed because it's a all always there whatever the system whatever the position in the system noise is always there it's a default case we cannot totally eliminate it so it's always there but we have to find solutions to overcome the effect of noise so what we do is we always keep our signal levels be more higher than the noise level so then noise levels kept kept uh, you know limited in a lower range that we don't want to worry about so but when it comes to a spectrum analyzer like this when we are analyzing signals you can see the noise components are also displayed but we are not going to worry about it our main concern goes with this sort of a reading okay 
So here you see a time domain um, outcome. This is an oscilloscope, just a time domain outcome. Uh, this is what you see, what you were going through previously is a frequency domain outcome. So in communication, we use all these, right? We use all these. So here all the things that you see. Now, if I take this sort of a thing, I don't know whether you have um, witnessed this sort of uh, outcome. Uh, when you are listening to music through a media player or any 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 player in a computer, you can choose a graphical equalizer. Just go and see, right click and see, you can go for EQ, equalizers, right? Equalizers, you can choose graphical equalizer. When it comes to graphical equalizer, when the song is playing, you can see there are bars, like right? different color bars going up and down. That is a frequency domain outcome. So what it shows is the frequencies. So here in this reading, in the x-axis, what you see is frequency. 31, 63 to 120, 125, 250, 500, 1000, 2000, 4000, 6000, blah, blah. All these are frequency components. Y-axis is dB, decibels. I will teach you what is decibels later. Uh, that is a unit of measuring the intensity of audio, intensity of sound or intensity of a signal. Okay, how powerful the signal is, decibel, right? Some sort of a logarithmic uh, interpretation for values. Uh, so I'll teach decibel. We are ha specifically having a lesson uh, in decibels. So I will teach it at that point. But anyway, uh, it's it's a measurement that we take to identify the intensity, how powerful it is. So now uh, Y axis show the strength of each bar and each bar is having a specific frequency and you see this is a range okay right so what you need to do when you are if you are if you are trying this at home just type spectrum analyzer and go for images you will find many just go through it and see so these are some handy spectrum analyzers uh handy ones where these GSM engineers, GSM people who are doing uh, mobile uh, engineering, radio communication, especially site surveying when they go for sites for uh, survey the antennas and all, uh, do troubleshooting, installing antennas, lot of type of things. Uh, they 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 normally have this portable type of devices. But in laboratories we have, you know, uh, some uh, larger ones. Uh, normally, you, you see frequency uh, spectrum analysis in, in computer applications as well. So that therefore we have to send the signal into somehow interface the signals with the computer system and through the softwares we get these uh, analysis. And um, in MATLAB Simulink, uh, in MATLAB, hope you know uh, the software MATLAB by now. In MATLAB, um, no, you will, you will get to know it uh, in the second semester somehow. There is a soft software in engineering, we call it MATLAB uh, and people who master mathematics, people who master finance, uh, you know, this thing uh, already deals with uh, this MATLAB software. It's totally with mathematical functioning. Whatever you are learning manually in all, all these mathematical as as aspects like calculus, trigonometry, blah, blah, blah. Then uh, statistics and this and that graphs all are included in this software. Whatever we simply do calculate, we can do it in that software. There's another option, you call it Simulink. So in this MATLAB software, if you go to the Simulink option, we have all these elements. We can simply um, create a, a circuit, input signals, and place spectrum analysis here and there, and observe how the signal goes. So some sort of a simulation can be done. So let's see, uh, based on the uh, time that we are getting, based on the content that we do, if we get a chance of uh, physically meeting, uh, I definitely, normally I do it. I definitely take uh, people to computer labs and um, do simple demonstrations with uh, simulating to understand how waves comes, how, how waves combine, what is the frequency domain, what is the time domain, everything. So let's see. Uh, if not, otherwise I will do some demonstration online make you feel better in this content right so that's enough let's go back to a uh, discussion so now this is very rough right this is a very basic thing but now you saw 
based on the thing that you learn, you saw exactly what is happening in the applications, right? So normally in communication, we have to refer to both uh, these types, time domain and analog domain, right? Okay. And um, with the completion of the, the, the chapter signals one day, you must be able to, if I give you a frequency or, or set of frequencies, you must be able to draw the time domain graph for that frequency as well as the frequency domain graph for that frequency, right? It can be a PO wave, it can be a combined wave or a complex wave, doesn't matter. Based on the details given, given you must be able to simply uh, plot the shape of the frequency domain and the time domain. That is our aim. Okay. A complete sine wave in the time domain can be represented by one single spike in the frequency domain. So in this picture, you see just a one line, but in that practical case, you saw uh, theoretically we draw a one line. That's true. But in the practical case, you need uh, to understand that uh, suddenly we don't get a spike, but we can tune it like now here. This is some sort of uh, some sort of uh, highly, you know, tuned. You don't see much uh, broad distribution of voltages. It's it's quite uh, you know sharp. Likewise, based on the electronics, based on the uh, system, based on the quality of the system, uh, you you will be able to get very sharp spikes, somewhat near to a one straight line, right? But when we are drawing theoretically like this, we simply draw a one line. But in the practical case, you simply get a you know increment and a decrement so it looks like something like a one uh, you know uh, curved curved thing but uh, more and more we are thinking about the quality of our system quality of electronics the the reliability of the electronic system what we are dealing with we can go for a highly you know uh, sharp edges uh, in this frequency spectrum. Now, if you see this one, you can see quite, uh, you know, very, very sharp. It's a, it's, it's almost a one line, right? Almost a one line. So that is all about the quality of uh, the work that we do and uh, the, the, the tuning capability of uh, the RLC circuits that we have in our systems. Likewise, there are a lot more uh, into circuitry, a lot more into system uh, characteristics, right? But anyhow, uh, in practice, you get an outcome like this. But when you are drawing it theoretically on a graph, uh, you, you, you simply draw a one line. Very simple. OK, very simple. So try to understand. Now, if this is megahertz, six megahertz here, just a line on top of six, uh, you have to change this hertz to megahertz. So now we are reading it as six megahertz. What is the peak amplitude is five volts. 6 megahertz peak amplitude is 5 volts. Okay. Right. So again, a complete sine wave in a time domain can be represented by a one single spike in the frequency domain. It is theoretically, but practically what you, uh, you saw actually what is happening. Time domain and frequency domain of three sine waves, of three sine waves, now, uh, sorry, uh, three, not three sine waves, actually uh, two sine waves. Uh, let me call it uh, three waves. Huh? Don't, don't uh, misunderstand here. Three waves. Let me call it three waves. The time domain and frequency, uh, time domain and frequency domain of three waves is shown below. Now, if you refer to the time domain, this is what you can see. Now let's uh, try to uh, be clear with the wave components. You can see three colors, right? The three waves are referred separately with three colors. <clears throat> a green color, high frequency, low amplitude green color wave. Same frequency wave with 10, uh, let me say volts, 10 volts amplitude which is in pink color and we get a direct current which is having a value of 15 volts, 15 volts, right? So we have um, low amplitude analog signal, 
high amplitude analog signal and a direct current with 15 plus 15 volts not in the negative domain in the positive domain now if we get these sort of things how to uh, plot them or how to um, show them on a frequency domain graph so let's take the smallest signal high frequency small amplitude if you count the number of cycles if you count the number of complete cycles within this one second time duration right in the time domain one second time range how many cycles you get 16 cycles if you count you get 16 cycles so that means within a one second 16 complete cycles means frequency is 16 hertz what is the peak amplitude 5 volts so you go to the frequency domain graph find the position 16 hertz just draw a vertical line on top of 16 which is having a height numerical height of 5 volts right now we have plotted 16 then you go for the the other way where we have uh, the intermittent amplitude 10 volts number of complete cycles if you count you get uh, 8 right 8 complete cycles how come you can see one one cycle inside of one uh, large cycle you have two smaller cycles right inside of large uh, pink color one cycle you get two smaller cycles so 16 within a one second 8 within one second so that means in a bigger uh, amplitude wave or low amplitude uh, low frequency wave the frequency is 8 hertz because within a one second you get eight revolutions eight cycles so you go for position eight in hertz draw a line with a height of 10 volts draw a line with a height of 10 volts right now comes the important part a direct current direct current what is the frequency of direct current frequency of direct current it's quite constant no changes no fluctuations so what is the frequency of direct current you cannot talk about a frequency of direct current why there is no alternating nature no alternating nature it's just a line no alternating means no vibration no vibration no, sorry no oscillation no alternating feature means no oscillation no oscillation means it's not a vibration there is no uh, revolutions there is no uh, thing like complete cycles or whatever it is therefore we cannot talk about a frequency why no change frequency is rate of change frequency is rate of change if there is no change if there is a constant it's stupid we are going to play the fool if you are going to you know talk about a change talk about a frequency because constant means no change so if we try to find the frequency of a constant that's a stupid thing so constant means no change so no, talking about a rate of change in a constant since there is no change it's no use so constant means rate of change is zero if you go to uh, you know by now you know simple differentiation right? in differentiation you know what is the differential coefficient of a constant zero right differential coefficient of a constant or if i say differentiate 15 what is the answer zero why since it's a constant there is no variation there is no variation so if there is no variation there is no a rate of variation no variation no rate of variation no rate of variation means excuse me right um, no variation means no rate no rate means no differentiation no differentiation means no differential coefficient so it's zero right that is why in in differentiation if someone asks you to differentiate a constant value you you simply tell it zero now here also the same it it directs directly linked with this this sort of a situation this sort of situations and i was telling uh, i don't know whether i got a chance of talking to you um, 
if if you all uh, have met me uh, no because i didn't do uh, any any uh, involvement in mathematics uh, when it comes to foundations uh, for two three batches because mr asit was there um, dealing with it uh, but uh, normally i used to tell this mathematics is a language when it comes to science mathematics is a language so here uh, if you say that uh, differentiation of a constant is zero uh, we 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 always use that uh, part to explain these sort of situations happening in application so now here you see zero no variation but how to represent it in mathematics differentiation of a constant is zero now you see here this is a constant value no variation no rate therefore it is zero right so mathematics is the language of describing these sort of things so you are learning the language in another planet then you take a rocket and come to this planet and you are learning engineering you don't know what is the link between the mathematics you are learning and the other aspects you are learning in other modules so please try to get this point and always when you are learning try to figure out what is the mathematical representation of this or when you are learning maths with someone else try to understand why the hell that we are learning maths why the hell that we are learning this part what is the meaning what is the application where are these parts apply now we are learning maths in one planet and then we go for another planet and learn engineering we, we go to the other planet and learn digital electronics communication no link right complete vacuum in the middle don't uh, let it happen again and again uh, this is because you are still in the beginning part of the second semester this is high time understanding the importance so when you are learning something now i did it sometimes uh, lecturers will not uh, realize it they will not do it they are assuming that you already know that part and they keep teaching but i touch that point now wasting uh, some of uh, both of us time but it it, it benefits you but uh, we cannot ex expect that from all the lecturers because it's waste of time so you you must be knowing it by now and trying to be always you know tricky understanding the relationship with whatever you learn so in that point when 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 lecturers give an opportunity to ask questions you need to question these points then you get a lot of questions because you are always when you are learning a new content you try to figure it out and and link it with whatever you learned uh, in the, in the past so then you get a lot of questions so when the lecturer invites you to ask questions you can you can you, you know make a blast ask questions as much as you can squeeze the squeeze to our our you know uh, our necks and you know try to take things out because you are paying money for information so you must be very much uh, you know active and very much uh, <clears throat> keen on uh, you know grabbing and you know troubling people and getting the information out somehow especially with these sort of uh, online situations right so please make note especially this is very important for engineering students since mathematics is the language you learn the language somewhere else and come and stay quiet in the application uh, without using the language because you you don't know what to say right that is like people learn english Um, but not applying it but they they sometimes people have a d pass or a, or a a plus plus for english in all levels but when they come out uh, people are not uh, used to it that is obviously happening it's not a problem it's it's because it's our second language and we are not using it but when people starts using it when they go for uh, jobs and all then they get get a chance of polishing it it doesn't matter that they what is the result that they got for all levels some people must not have been passed the uh, english examination in the olives but they they speak well they don't know this bloody grammar and all this this thing and that thing but they speak very well people who is uh, doing this you know uh, tourism and all in the in the coastal area people who have, haven't go to school properly but they they speak uh, different languages uh, french they speak french german japanese this and that and english very well but uh, without any technical knowledge that is because we are using it so when you start using this you will be, be you know getting a chance of uh, nicely linking the mathematics you are learning with the content uh, the other engineering content you do so that makes benefit for you in the future right in the future i am not going to talk those now but somehow it is going to make benefits we'll see later on 
how come that it makes benefit what are the what are the openings for you right okay so now you understood constant you know when we say direct current you can link ah direct current is a constant voltage yes perfect but then the next level constant ah it's a constant right okay now when i say frequency domain i am saying students right if you see a constant voltage and when it is direct current there is no frequency so frequency is zero therefore you take just the voltage value go to the frequency zero point and plot the line with a height of 15 volts that's it my job is over as a communication lecturer my job is over now how come you are going to figure it, figure this out what you know so far is this is a direct current how to identify this line this is a direct current what is the voltage voltage is constant 15 volts this is what you learned in uh, electronics now in telecommunication i am teaching right now this is you know that this is a direct current okay good now how to plot a direct current with a constant voltage in a frequency domain students see now there is no any variation here no oscillation nothing so frequency is zero go to the frequency zero point plot the line that is how we plot direct current in frequency domain graph my job is also over now you were learning mathematics with someone else and you learn analog electronics and all these with uh, mr dilom pasindu maybe miss areka or someone else uh, or dr malaka maybe then you come to communication and learning communication with mr yasit then you are moving to another module in another semester blah 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 that you go what happens to that mathematics you are learning where that you are going to apply it and why the hell that you are learning mathematics it's very hard no anyway it's hard for most of you it's hard and it's a headache but still you have to do it why that you are doing it why that you are facing this much trouble why that you are suffering a lot no one thinks about it there is a huge reason behind it it's a critical very serious reason behind it the serious reason is mathematics make you link things right mathematics make you understand things in a different level and link things so when it comes to new innovation new thinking you need mathematics to do it from only concepts we cannot come up with new models we we cannot come up with new ideas we need mathematical interpretation we use mathematical equation do calculation based on this analysis we will be able to come up with new uh, content right come up with new content okay right okay so uh, try to understand what i said uh, linking in, in mathematics is very important so i'll i'll repeat constant now this is how you this is what you have to do right you know constant yes so when it is constant no frequency no variation no rate of change therefore zero therefore frequency is zero now you need to ask the question sir why that you said frequency is zero when it is direct current ah that is a question you need to ask then my my answer why that i said frequency is zero is because frequency is rate of change of waves since you don't have a change here in in voltage since you don't have an oscillation here you don't get a rate of change since you don't have change no rate of change no rate of change means zero frequency is zero that is why we are marking zero here perfect now you know the link then rate of change where did we learn rate of change in maths rate of change is differentiation rate of change is differentiation we can we differentiate displacement and we get velocity we differentiate velocity and we get acceleration rate of change displacement uh, sorry rate of change is differentiation uh, in differentiation when you differentiate a constant difference and coefficient of the constant is zero that is why it happens so when you differentiate a direct current answer is zero frequency is zero what is the definition of the frequency rate of change rate of change in signals 
rate how many times this keeps on changing its appearance one cycle again another cycle again another cycle it always changes eight times within a second rate of change is eight frequency so it has a rate okay it's eight value is eight but if don't if it doesn't has a change have a change no rate of change therefore no frequency frequency is zero but still it has a value you need to show the value okay students so that's it that's it um, with time domain and frequency domain most importantly you need to know the difference between the two domains and why that we call it domains and uh, most importantly how to plot a direct current in or a constant value in a frequency domain graph it always comes on top of zero now i hope you uh, at least get a brief uh, you know understanding of how what sort of a concern what sort of a focus you need to have when you are learning things in especially higher education and most especially in engineering right you have to be very much intelligent you have to be very much uh, focus with what you do if you can't understand please consult us consult your lecturers go and tell them just 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 cry and you know ara mala vadeyak vela vata vela vata vela hari aa ganna katti ekinuma right so please uh, take that uh, advice as an as an important advice so i i will hope that uh, you will you will take this important much important and practice right while practicing if you are facing any problem let me know so i'll try my best to uh, you know clear everything for you all during my sessions right so i'm not going to go further today so by with this one we we we, we finished the part 1 and i have shared the part 2 with you all okay uh, if you check the chat line i have shared the uh, part 2 that means next week discussion slides Uh, i don't want you to uh, go through it and uh, understand what you can do is uh, simply if you if you if you want you just do do a bit of skim reading or scan reading actually to see what sort of things that we are going to discuss anyway uh, next discussion is based on um, how we combine analog waves if we combine analog waves what sort of a thing happen and uh, plotting different different aspects in time domain and frequency domain graph separately that's what uh, is going to happen uh, next day okay right uh, students with that case uh, it's pretty much for today thanks for uh, staying with me then thanks for listening thanks for staying with uh, my session looking forward to come with more and more uh, good information next week till then uh, have fun and especially be safe and be much more responsible Goodbye everyone